Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Brian de Rubet. He uh, made it also from the uh, other session here. He will talk on uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, venous arterial, and, and neurogenic. Brian. Thank you, Jos. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go over the management of this uh, syndrome, uh, which is uh, basically three different syndromes. So it's a lot to cover in 10 minutes. I'll try to get through as much as I can. Um, uh, I do these in conjunction with one of my partners, Hugh Gellibert, who's one of the, the leaders in this area, on, at least on the West Coast. Um, and uh, he's, he does the bulk of the work in our practice. Um, this is a, a problem that is, is not as common as many of the other vascular diseases that um, we face. And so this is something that generally at each center, there's one or two people that really focus on this disease. Um, these are my disclosures relevant to this, um, this talk. So the thoracic outlet is the anatomical region defined by the first rib inferiorly and the manubrium uh, anteriorly with the verte vertebral column posteriorly. And so that, that entire uh, circle here is the thoracic outlet. Um, the structures that cross out of the thoracic outlet into the arm include the, the subclavian vein, the subclavian artery, and the brachial plexus. And you can see that these are bordered superiorly or caudally, um, or, sorry, rostrally by the, um, by the, uh, the clavicle itself. And, um, uh, and so this is the area that becomes the, the problematic area in thoracic outlet syndrome. It's, the, it's the, uh, the first rib inferiorly and then the muscles that connect the first rib to the clavicle largely. Um, clavicle or to the spinal column. So thoracic outlet syndrome is a group of related symptoms, uh, findings of which are associated with compression of this neurovascular bundle as it exits the thoracic outlet. Um, the important uh, uh, anatomy here is shown here. This is the anterior portion of the rib. This is where the subclavius muscle inserts under the first rib. This is the groove for the subclavian uh, vein. Um, this is the scalenus anterior insertion, the uh, groove for the uh, artery and the brachial plexus, followed by the uh, scalenus uh, medius, or the mi um, middle scalene muscle. And when you look at the, the triangles that these structures form, which are outlined here, we see that the venous triangle, or the costo, uh, basically triangulates the costoclavicular space. And this, again, is bordered anteriorly by the subclavius, posteriorly by the anterior scalene, and then inferiorly by the first rib. And so this is the area of compression, generally due to hypertrophy of these two muscles uh, when, you, when you have a patient with venous thoracic outlet syndrome. In terms of arterial and neurogenic thoracic outlet, it's the interscalene triangle, which again is anteriorly bordered by the uh, middle scalene muscle. Uh, posterior um, borders the, the um, sorry, anterior scalene and then uh, middle scalene muscle. And this again encompasses the, the uh, uh, subclavian artery and the, and the brachial plexus. So those two um, uh, syndromes are, are encapsulated within this interscalene muscle, uh, interscalene triangle. So the clinical presentation of TOS is, is threefold. There's neurogenic, there's arterial, and venous. Neurogenic being by far the most common, um, but oftentimes not treated surgically. Um, arterial being the least common, a pretty rare entity, and, and the one that I tend to deal with most in terms of doing thrombolysis and interventional procedures is the venous, um, uh, uh, venous uh, TOS. Uh, neurogenic TOS is definitely uh, very common. Uh, anyone in this room who puts their hands above their head and, and uh, after a few minutes gets numbness and tingling in their hands or fingers probably to some degree has thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, uh, again, not all of these need to be treated, and the, and the, um, the presentation of neurogenic can range from pain, paresthesias, all the way to atrophy of muscle due to uh, significant impingement on the, on the brachial plexus. Um, I'll go over some of these other uh, 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 symptoms as we get to each of those respective uh, uh, syndromes. So neurogenic uh, TOS is basically a syndrome of pain or paresthesias in the upper extremity attributed to compression of the brachial plexus at the thoracic outlet or in that, uh, in that posterior triangle. Um, there's a number of different um, physical exam findings and, and uh, maneuvers you can do to elicit some of these symptoms that we see. And as I said, the patients can present with a very significant range of symptoms. And so um, patients with uh, mild paresthesias often can be taught some exercises to do that, that will alleviate those, those problems and certain positions to avoid, which will also help. Um, patients with more severe uh, symptoms, uh, chronic pain, uh, muscle atrophy certainly, those are ones that d deserve more of a diagnostic workup. And, and the, the, the bulk of the workup at this point in our group is to proceed pretty quickly to anterior scaling, scaling muscle blocks. And what you're doing in this case is you do an ultrasound-guided injection of lidocaine into the anterior scalene muscle. 
And this does not produce an anesthesia or paralysis of the muscle, but it does relax, uh, the, causes relaxation of the anterior scalene muscle. And this by itself is a very good diagnostic test. Um, a positive response to this test are patients that get greater than 50% reduction in their symptoms with this test. And, and that indicates that it's very likely this, this is the, the problem. There are a number of other uh, diagnostic studies, nerve conduction tests, and other things which we often will have the patients do. But this is the, probably the most telling, single most telling um, uh, diagnostic study for us. In terms of management, I already alluded to this before. Uh, the, main, the main issues are, number one, alleviate certain causes, ergonomic issues, you know, evaluate how they sit at their desk, what their different activities are, and what sort of uh, uh, positional modifications you can make to that to help them with some of these, um, to help them with their symptoms. All patients then go from the next escalation of that is to go to physical therapy, and there's a number of uh, different exercises and uh, potential uh, ways of benefiting from physical therapy. And with physical therapy and pain medication, many of these patients can, can get by. Uh, the next step up from that is our nerve blocks. We use bot, uh, Botox, essentially, to do nerve blocks. Or, or muscle blocks, I should say, I'm sorry, um, to relax the muscle on a long-term basis. And patients can get repeated injections over time uh, to, to, to keep relief of symptoms. Some patients can be treated with this, uh, with this, in this manner for a long term, but patients with the more severe symptoms, they, they, of course, will recur once the Botox wears off. And those are the patients that we ultimately bring for surgical de decompression. But it is helpful in dealing with ne these neurogenic patients to, to go through this process, get to know the patient well, and, and sort of uh, and, and manage expectations because many of these patients do still have some residual symptoms afterward, and it's, and it's helpful to, to have the patient very informed about what they're going through when they go through the surgical decompression. Uh, surgical de decompression is done uh, primarily two ways, uh, transaxillary rib resection and scalene muscle resection is how, how we do it. Um, supraclavicular scalene muscle um, resection, scalene muscle resection and rib resection is, is probably, the, probably the more common way uh, nationwide, especially among uh, surgeons who are more familiar with the supraclavicular exposure. Um, this is how we do the transaxillary incision. So it's basically a very small incision in the uh, axillary region. The arm is put on a, uh, on a specially made arm board specifically for this operation to lift up the arm and open up this space to allow us room to work. This shows the view that you get in this position with the subclavian vein here, the subclavian artery here, and the brachial plexus beyond it. Uh, subclavius muscle up here, uh, anterior scalene muscle, and the middle scalene muscle, which basically en encompass the, the, um, the, uh, the, the triangle that, that is affected in neurogenic TOS. Um, this just shows basically carefully dissecting off the, um, this, the first subclavius muscle and then the uh, anterior scalene muscle followed by the middle scalene muscle. Um, once all of these muscles are divided, we then divide the uh, ligaments between the ribs and ultimately resect the rib. And once this main section is out, you then basically use rongeurs to, to disarticulate the, the entire rib. It's important to get the entire rib all the way back to cartilaginous tissue in the uh, posterior in the spine as well as toward the manubrium because we have seen patients uh, that have been, have been treated with incomplete rib resections which, who literally grow their rib back. So it is very possible to, to grow your rib back if you leave uh, tissue behind or, or bone behind. And that makes for the, the second operation obviously is a much, much more difficult operation. Um, so moving to venous TOS, this is one that we, we as vascular surgeons uh, who do both surgical and interventional work see a lot. This is again compression of the axial subclavian vein at the thoracic outlet, most commonly presenting with thrombosis or an upper extremity DVT, although patients can present with symptoms of venous congestion as well. It's just a little harder to diagnose and less common. This just shows the <clears throat> uh, some of the anatomy I showed you before, the uh, anterior rib, the posterior rib. Um, here's the subclavius muscle, and here's the anterior scalene muscle. And you can see how tight this groove is for the venous, uh, for the, the venous outlet area or, or, the, or the subclavian vein. And it's largely due to this anterior scalene muscle hypertrophy. And if you contrast that with a patient who had their rib taken out for venous TOS, uh, sorry, neurogenic TOS, you see how wide this, this space is compared to this one over here. So this is the problem really in these patients, muscle hypertrophy that limits this, this, um, this groove here. Uh, presentation I mentioned can, is generally with a DVT, although intermittent non-occlusive uh, symptoms can occur as well. Um, most often we're getting these patients because of sudden acute swelling of their arm. It takes sometimes a little while to diagnose this, but once we get a patient with an upper extremity DVT, we try to rush them for, to thrombolysis as soon as possible because as you let this uh, uh, clot sit for you know, greater than about two weeks or so, your, your chance of complete clot uh, lysis with thrombolysis diminishes. This is a typical appearance of a patient. Oftentimes their arm can be significantly more swollen, but you see the cyanosis, uh, venous congestion, venous distension, and, and swelling of the arm. 
there's different ways of diagnosing this. By and large, we use um, venous, um, uh, uh, sorry, Doppler examination or ultrasound. This is done right in our vascular lab in our office, and that's generally where we stop. Once we diagnose an upper extremity DVT, um, we then proceed pretty much right to the cath lab to, to start thrombolysis. Um, this just shows that this is a very early study from the 70s that, that demonstrates a reason why we're pretty aggressive about uh, thrombolysis and, and um, uh, decompression. Uh, this shows 48 patients managed with anticoagulation alone and, it, and it, uh, with a long-term follow-up out to six years. And you can see that at long-term follow-up, 90% of these patients had an occluded venogram uh, and very many, a good percentage of them had congestive symptoms as well. Um, so we've been pretty aggressive about this. This aggressive strategy has been challenged recently uh, in the past few years or so. Jason Lee from Stanford published this paper uh, discussing the selective uh, decompression, selective rib resection in these patients. Uh, and they have fairly good results, but I'll, I'll point out in this, in this slide of their 64 patients, um, any patient after thrombolysis, any patient that recurrent symptoms was offered a first rib resection, this is about half their patients. Of the other half that were managed selectively, one in five ultimately required a, a rib resection for recurrent thrombosis. So, so we tend to be somewhat aggressive, not only to, to deal with these symptoms, but also to prevent um, need for um, uh, uh, repeat thrombolysis. This is our general approach, and I won't go through it in, in much detail, but essentially we bring the patient to the cath lab, we thrombolyze them generally for two to three days, and then depending on how tight that residual lesion is, we decide whether to do the rib resection that same hospitalization or delay it. If there's no significant compression left behind, then sometimes we'll delay this to let them deal with the, uh, the post-operative issues. The one thing I, I think the most important point to take home from this, if you do venous thrombolysis for these procedures, never stent the, the phlebitic vein uh, prior to decompression, and even rarely after decompression do you stent this. And, and I really stress this because the, the patients that we've had the most trouble with um, are ones that have been stented before the, the, the syndrome was recognized and before the rib came out. And these patients are generally young, well-insured, and active, and, and they do seek second and third opinions. And so even if you have a, a surgeon that does some TOS but is, is uh, you know, is uh, for whatever reason, not interested in doing a rib resection, I would encourage the patient to get a, a second opinion and, and maybe even refer him to a center that does a lot of this. Um, I'm going to uh, just quickly go through uh, some angiograms. This shows an occluded um, uh, subclavian vein. This is after thrombolysis. You can also still see residual thrombotic material in here. This is one that we probably would be able to sit on for a little while. Uh, and, and take the rib out at a later date after some anticoagulation. This is a patient with significant collateralization from their occlusion, uh, residual compression. So something like this, we're going to want to generally take care of that the same hospitalization because of this residual compression here. Um, a rib section is done, ribs taken out, and we often will follow this with post-operative venoplasty because these patients often will have residual scar tissue that sometimes we'll go back and treat every, every three months or so. So I, I um, think I'm going to end there. Uh, arterial TOS, as I said, is very uncommon. The mainstay of treatment here is uh, after these patients present generally with embolization um, is to dissolve the clot with thrombolysis. Uh, in many of these patients, we do decompression. Some of them get revascularization as well, generally with a bypass. I'll, I'll stop there in the interest of time. <laughs>